it's the same way you choose this path of making movies. If you're going to commit to doing something, and if you have that fire, that large in your belly, then you're gonna, you're gonna destroy everything in its path to achieve the highest level all the time. And I wasn't gonna let a broken back stop me. Hi, I'm Robert Richardson, and this is the timeline of my career. It's a long career, so beware. I had gone to El Salvador on a documentary for Frontline, and when I returned, the sound man that had been working with me became the assistant director to Oliver Stone on Salvador. Ramon made a recommendation to meet me. I went in and met Oliver. It was sweltering hot, they didn't have any air conditioning. And Oliver was wearing a leather jacket, and he's pouring sweat. To meet Oliver the first time, my, you know, I was like, I was shaking. To be asked to shoot a feature when you're 28 years old, and I remember the woman I was with at the time who became my future wife, uh, the, the two of us were like, I can't believe this is already happening. I felt comfortable because he wanted to attack it from the perspective of documentary. I felt very comfortable with a camera on my shoulder and instinctively reacting to whatever's taking place in front of me. And I always have. I think that's something that's, uh, that's hidden within my work. It was remarkable because at the end of Salvador, Oliver said to me, you know, it had been tough, it's a tough shoot. Um, and learning to work with a director, you know, it's a very demanding man, as you can, you can well expect. So for me, dealing with him was dealing with something that I've never had before, somebody so forceful, who is also an extraordinarily brilliant writer and an extremely precise director. And then to say at the end, he goes, I have a project I'm trying to get off the ground and I'd like you to shoot it. And it was Platoon. And I read Platoon and I was shocked by Platoon. It was a film that was very dear to him because it's his story. And then to consider how to shoot that movie so it wouldn't feel like we were replicating Salvador. There's a documentary element, but there was a lot more on dollies and long lenses and counter moves. Also, we needed the level of improvisation to have the shoulder in combination because there are sequences within the movie where Oliver wasn't feeling like, I'm getting the reaction I need out of the actors. He would plant uh, gasoline bombs around the action and in the middle of the performance, he'd blow them up without them knowing. And of course you get this reaction because no one's expecting it. For the actors, it suddenly became, this is real, it's in front of me. And sometimes you'd hear a lot of shots being fired. Not live ammo, but blanks and things like that to throw them off. But if you look back in retrospect, you've got Johnny Depp. You probably don't even know Johnny Depp was in the movie. Forrest Whitaker. You have so many actors that are inside that, that went on to find strong careers. I mean, when you look back in retrospect, but when I'm in the middle of it, I'm not thinking about it. I'm more in the zone of shooting a movie, and I'm thinking less about where it sits in the timeline. When I got the nomination, I was, you've got to be kidding me. And it was my first event. And I had my first real suit tie, I was all dressed up. I had also a tremendous level of fear about the event. I have a, a huge phobia of being in this place, but I had a greater phobia of like having to walk up on a stage and deliver a speech. I'm sitting next to people that have admired my entire life in terms of the, the, what they've created. These people were a part of what brought me into the world and understanding of how to shoot and I'm sitting next to them, and I'm meeting people that I've held up as gods for most of my life. And so for me, it was totally fresh, but when I got there, I started to panic. I started to yawn, and I'm yawning, and I'm yawning. And I can't stop yawning, because I'm not getting enough oxygen into my system, so my body's trying to pull more, and I feel like I'm gonna pass out any second. And the second, the second they said the winner was, and it wasn't me, out. I just had to leave. I could not stay any longer and I swore I'd never go back to another Academy Award because my fear was so great, which is why I ended up missing, which will slip by, but why I missed up, uh, did not arrive at JFK. 
because I was so frightened of the first experience that I, I didn't want to repeat. You really have me consorting with a sordid cast of characters, Please don't answer you? the question. Of course not. Such a pity, that assassination. In fact, I admired President Kennedy, a man of true panache, wife of impeccable taste. Oliver and I formed a bond, and he was shooting a film a year. The only time I'd go away was when I could schedule something that would fit. And I'd always ask Oliver, like, you know, and he'd tell me, like, I'm going to be doing this. And so I would fit in films like, you know, whether it be Rob Reiner's A Few Good Men, or was working with Errol Morris on, you know, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. I knew Oliver was what, who I wanted. I was working with Oliver. So he had become a brother to me and he's keenly responsible for a lot of my personality now. I'm in love with Oliver. He's a, like, we don't see a lot of each other anymore, but he was a brother. He made me very aware of the level of concentration required that you have to come with 100% every single day. He made me very aware of the quality of a word man versus an, a bird man. I versus words, what are more important? For me, when I watch a movie, I don't evaluate it from the perspective of what's it look like? Oh, that was a great shot. I, I, unless the movie's bad, or unless they're coming back to watch it and study it for why it's good. And I think that what was central to that particular film was the recreation. The, the eight millimeter that was used to shoot the Zapruder film. So we centered everything out of the eight millimeter, which we shot in Super 8, but we tried to move out from that circle to all the way up to 35. But if you want to talk about something visually, like Oswald in the cell, when he's burning out so heavy, it's like, it's like 13 stops overexposed or whatever it was. And I, I remember I was doing A Few Good Men and Rob Reiner had just seen the movie. <laughs> he leans forward and goes, Bob, uh, I saw JFK, it's a great movie. But I have a question. Why was Oswald so overexposed? And I was like, all oh, the f***ing things. I mean, I love that aspect. But, you know, it bothered him and it took him out of the movie. Daddy coming, Mama. Soon, he's coming soon. He's real party. See that? Dumb Jew motherfucker. Grew up together and he's acting like he don't even know me. The AD on JFK was a, a man named Joseph Reedy. And Joe had done a number of films with Oliver and myself. And, and he also did simultaneously work with Marty on a number of his films. At one point, Marty asked, uh, said that he wanted to have a meeting with me for Cape Fear. So I went to New York and met him for Cape Fear. Now, I'd always wanted to work with Marty. I mean, you know, why would you not want to work with Scorsese? It's like, he's a pinnacle. He's, you know, the same way that we, we look at many people now. It's like, you know, he's a god of cinema. I wanted to meet him and I went in and I had prepared certain thoughts for the movie. And he very politely sat in a chair and I pulled out photographs from Edward Marie, I mean, like all these f***ing strange things, you know, and, and he looked at me at the end, he said, it was a tremendous pleasure meeting you, but I've actually already made my decision on who I'm gonna hire. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll head back to California now. And it was like that, you know, it was like, it was like okay, I met him, but then when Michael Bajas was not available to shoot Casino, He'd already met me and he felt comfortable and he brought me in to start that film. I started, we scouted. I was there for about three weeks and Marty was in, um, in California, in Los Angeles, doing the final rewrite. I'd seen all the locations, I didn't know what else to do. So I asked Joe Reedy and Barbara Defina, if, uh, who was the producer, if I could just write some notes down about ideas. And they said, yeah, sure. So I put together these ideas of shots and things for the film. And I'd done that my whole career with Oliver. With Marty, I, I, he got these notes and I was suddenly called into the production office and Barbara Defina. And Barbara was uh, head down uh, behind the table. She looks up and she goes, uh, Marty wants to talk to you. And I mean, my head went down like, oh f Okay, I said, about what? About the notes. <laughs> Marty got on the phone, very polite. Because he is a tremendous gentleman. He goes, Bob, I got your notes. I have not looked at them, nor will I ever look at them. 
When I finish writing a script and I'm happy with my script, I will give you a note for every shot in the film. That was it. And I left like, oh, all right. I guess I'll be operating and lighting on this show. Some people want more help. And I, could, I like to work in all capacities. I like to be a chameleon. Anyway, that was the result of uh, my mistake. Almost, I thought, was gonna get me fired, but it, fortunately it did not. It, it's not collaborative with Marty. It's collaborative in terms of lighting. Marty will talk about and, and do, and it's very important, he'll do screenings. Like for Casino, it was a number of John Alton's films that he had, and that his photography, John Alton's a, a cinematographer. And it was a style of lighting, and it was a noir. And so for me, I was learning like, okay, this is where he wants to go. And he would show films in each of the films that we ever made, he would put us into a screening room. Marty would sometimes be there, sometimes not. If he was there, he would be making comments about certain shots during the piece to say, I, what I like here is I like the level of shadow and I like this and I like that. And, and what he's doing is giving you the ideas of where he wants you to extend yourself and your lighting and to step up into this place. That's a collaboration. And uh, also about operating. He's extremely specific about his operating. So I had to hone my tools as an operator to work with him. And uh, I, I did, I became a much better operator. We had to work in the Riviera. This is old Vegas. New Vegas was only slowly coming. They were just beginning to take down a number of the major casinos uh, in Vegas. But we were on an all-night schedule because we were utilizing the Riviera. And they would only give it to us in the evening from like, I think, 5 o'clock. So then we had to black out all the windows. We could only work in certain sections. If there was a high roller, you couldn't work there. So we would be working like 5 to 5 or five to, or, or 6 to 6 or whatever it ended up being. So you go all the way to dawn. And that was for many, many months so it was a very difficult world to work within i know we're supposed to avoid each other but you know there's ways to do things and there's ways not to. i wanted to do pulp fiction because i knew the key grip and he was going to uh talk to quinn but it never took place i never had a meeting so then i went and i got i saw the kill bill script i got gotten that through a back channel read it I don't know if he knows I read it, and asked to have a meeting. And Quentin said, sure, I'll meet with Bob. And we met at uh, a restaurant on, uh, I think, Hollywood Boulevard. And the way he tells the story is, I had 14 espressos. Um, now, I, I can believe that might be true. 14, mm, that makes sense. That's about my number a day. And uh, he, said, I don't, he said I didn't even eat. But it was so great to just talk with him. It just felt like easy chemistry floating together. It was like, Solid, solid as a rock. I learned later that he'd already hired two DPs, one to shoot in China, one to shoot in America. But he offered me the job. They originally said, you know, would you do just America? I said, I I'd like to do the whole movie. He agreed, I guess, so he let both the other DPs go. And uh, that was the beginning of our relationship. That kind of fight choreography, I'd never done before. It was a learning experience, obviously. Now, I'd watched a lot of these films that were shot, and I'd, I'd watched what the master had done himself with uh, his work with choreography, so I was well aware of what they might do, but once you start to see all the wire work happening, it was awe-inspiring, but also it just pushed you higher. Like, I gotta reach their level, I gotta do better, I gotta create at a higher level. And, uh, and working with Quintus like that as well, working with any great director is about creating at a very high level. The higher your level, the better it is. I, I, I think uh, I've been extraordinarily fortunate in my life to have such magnificent directors. I feel very, very fortunate. He discovered her for this picture, and we think her platinum blonde locks and hot jazz baby doll style are gonna make her a big star. I got a call to go to uh, Beverly Hills and meet with uh, Marty. And I was with Joe Reedy, who I've talked about before as assistant director. And I had this plan. I pulled my hair out, put it down. Put, I took a, one of his white bathrobes, put it around me. I took Kleenex and I put it between every toe. 
as Howard used it in his later life, I hid in the darkness of a room. And so when Joe brought in Marty, I was hiding in the spot. And Marty says, well, where's Bob? And I go, Marty, I'm over here. And he turned towards me. And I go, if you need somebody to play an old Howard Hughes, I'm here. Anyway, we worked and it was a, the script required so much preparation, but you're working with some of the most talented people in the business. Dante is a brilliant production designer. You know, you're sitting in that situation where it's daunting, but you're in, the, in, in a very high league of talent. You're playing at the very highest level and you need to provide the highest A game you can. And it was, it was, a, it was a huge reach for me because of the sequences, the music, the colors. The first time I actually, when I, finally when I started to say, okay, Bob, you need to go, you need to go. And I was sitting next to Oprah and I'd gotten two shots of tequila. And that was on top of many others that I'd had. And I ran into Santana who was out there and it's like, oh, f me to Santana. It's like, I was so like, I don't need to go back to the Oscars. This, this is really where I want to go. This is rock and roll. I was like, and I got back in and uh, Oprah leaned over and said, where'd you go? I said, I went out and got two drinks. And uh, she looked at me and she was like furious. That's an insult to the Academy. And I'm thinking, have you looked at the bar, by the way? That bar is full and it's full all the time. But you're absolutely right. But then I knew what I wanted to say. So the whole issue was my mother was in the hospital at that time and uh, they thought she was gonna die. And the nurses and the doctors had all taken extreme care of her. I, had, I just knew what I was gonna say, which I wanted to dedicate this Oscar to the health givers, you know, to the health care givers and to the doctors, um, not only that are taking care of my mother, but to all. And uh, so I wasn't afraid of having to say a speech. I did the speech relatively easily in that one. is just one of the letters. We were gonna shoot the film initially in 35 millimeter anamorphic. I was there looking at anamorphic lenses and we brought it up to Dan Sasaki at Panavision and Dan was going through the lens and we wanted to shift it a little bit. I wanted an older flavor to it. And while he was playing with the lens, there was a curtain on both sides because he projected it onto a screen. And I walked back into this room and there were these strange shaped lenses. And we pick it up and he, I grab one, he grabs one, and we go out to Dan and go, Dan, what are these? And he goes, whoa. <laughs> And that's how we got to shooting uh, in, that for, in the format we ended up with. They hadn't been used in 50 years. And one by one, Panavision stuck with us. We didn't tell Quentin if he knew that we could get anywhere near a Cinerama frame, he would have just exploded. So I did tests with him in, in regular 35, I was 35 anamorphic. And then we opened the screen while he was there. And we put up the next ones and go, and he's like, Oh my God, what is this? He said, well, we have these lenses, Quinn. We can't guarantee they'll all be ready in time, but... And it was remarkable. He was so, so happy. And those lenses are now extremely, extremely hard to find. Everyone's using them. They're... I can't get them. I should be able to get them anytime I want. Because you don't have to just shoot widescreen 279. You can shoot a smaller format and just use the middle section of a lens. That's very highly technical, who wants that? That was a very difficult movie for me. We were in Telluride on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, two friends asked me to go skiing and I went with them. And I went skiing before the game started. And on about my third or fourth run, I flipped and hit a mogul and broke my back. There were no doctors on duty that day because they're all, I mean, you couldn't find a doctor. So I went to work to the next day, not knowing what had happened, whether I, maybe broken a rib. I ended up going at lunchtime and they did x-rays and, and MRI and they said, you have a broken back, you have to stop working. The phone rang almost instantly. Quinn needs you back on the set now. And I already knew I was going back. It wasn't, Quinn didn't have to call me back. I'm, I'm gonna work with a broken back. 
just give me a brace, give me something, give me a, a, a small painkiller, give me something, and I'll just go back and do it. And I shot the movie in Telluride and all through uh, the sections we did because we rebuilt it on a stage at Red Studio. And then I shot in there with the same broken back. That was complicated because I'd often find myself on the floor or in a position that was extremely hard to accomplish. The pain was so extraordinary, I just would have tears coming out. I wouldn't, if I was on the crane, I had to do something and I was bent, I would sit there for as long as it took to get the next take. I was not gonna lift my body off. I didn't move, I just, once I found that position, even though it hurt, I'd just stay in it. And I'd just look down at the earth and then wait to the next take and then do the next take. In Telluride, you know, it was cold in Telluride, but it was bearable. In the studio, it was the worst because they had these giant trucks outside pumping in, so it was always below freezing. And then on top of that, they pumped in water so that you'd get, they found the perfect temperature and mixture that would form breath out of the actors. We would constantly attempt to sabotage the water. Gotta kill this, gotta kill this, it's too cold. You know, but we were always caught. They would all go out to lunch and it'd be 90 degrees or 100 degrees in California. And I would just go to a back room and lie on a cold floor so that my back would feel better. It, what, it was hell. Oh, all that stupid. I ripped my goddamn arm off. My dear old mother. Hey. You're a fucking dog. Don't you forget it. I got called up to go see Quentin. And this usually happens. We got a film. Baba, why don't you come up and read the script? And I said, great. I think I went up to his house. We haven't seen each other in a while, so usually we'll sit down, have a cocktail. Usually it's a margarita. And then he handed me the script. And he handed me the script in his living room on a small dining room table. And he didn't leave the room. I'm reading the script and talk about daunting. My asking was daunting. Daunting to stand in front of the writer while I'm reading his script. Now I'm making multiple notes because I don't know this, I don't know that. Who is this? Because a lot, a lot of it's about television and music and I'm not, uh, he's so specific. I'm just taking my time and it's, you know, it's a good four hour read. And Quentin is in there doing his thing, watching movies, doing whatever. And I would catch him glancing at me just to see whether I had a smile on my face or didn't have a smile on my face. And I always, I, it was such a, such a brilliant script. And I get to the end and I go, oh, Quentin, where, where's the final act? How does this movie end? I can't give that out. You'll get that later. Later? Well, I, I need to know what the ending is. No, you'll get that later. And it wasn't until we started firmly into production, you got assigned to a room, someone went to a safe, pulled the ending out, brought it to you, you read it, you had to go back, give it to the person, and they would put it in, total security. I don't even know if they allowed me to have my bag and my phone in the room. Quentin uh, will often be right beside me. If the camera's on a dolly, he wants to ride the dolly. When we're on a crane, the cranes aren't that capable of carrying the two of us. So it's usually me and he just has to sort of trust that aspect. But that's, that's about the only time he looks at video is when he can't ride something or be there. When Quinn's there, they just turn the monitor towards him. When people ask me, what is the movie about? I said, it's about when your career gets to a certain level, it begins to ebb down. You know, like if you're a Leo and then you find that the projects that are coming in are not nearly as valuable as the previous projects, then you see this sort of demise and you begin to take, feel less about yourself. I always felt that this is what this movie is and that's how it relates to me, is like, are you at this point? Are you at the point where you're not gonna get any good scripts anymore? And uh, you know, you never know, it could be. When I look at my work, I never thought about the future because I was only thinking about the present. You're gonna be moving forward, you're on, you're on the express, you, and you're fortunate. You wanna keep this thing going. That's what's important, is that we keep moving forward. And when you're on it, you're on a wave. It's like surfing. When you get it, you just kinda of hope that wave stays up there for a substantial period of time, which is remarkable, and I, I feel graced by that.